Uh, welcome in the Goethe Institute. Welcome in Goethe Institute. Welcome to the Goethe Institute. The taal vandaag is in het Engels, and that makes it easy for me to go on in that language. I'm really happy to finally have Alida Asman here, and uh, you see, you're honored by a lot of people. Good to have you here. Really, really nice. She's going to have a lecture and later a talk with Lars Ebert. And um, the theme is Die Vieldeutigkeit der Welt, Public Spirit, Social Cohesion. Um, in our text, when we uh, announced the event, we wrote, or together we wrote, the division of society and the radicalization of its climate have become the focus of our attention and are confirmed daily with new evidence. And uh, just look at Halle, at Hanau, and now at the Carnival Parade in Volksmarsen. It's, it's, it's shocking. Um, and for sure, not the sign of a sane and well-functioning society. And now talking only about Germany, which is not the only example around it. This, of course, scares a lot of people. And I'm really looking forward to your lecture, Alida Asman, where you are as well going to explain some ideas of how to restore a sense, or restore, sorry, a sense of community. I thank Herengracht 401, I thank the Genootschap Nederlands Duitsland for the good cooperation, not only today, but we had it lots of times together and we will have it in the future, I'm sure. Uh, afterwards, always after our lectures and readings and stuff, we have a small borrel, I don't know the English word, let's name it get together. Yeah, yeah, drinks, drinks and nuts. Yes. And as I said, Lars Ebert will lead through the evening. I shortly present him and he will then do the same with our guest, Alida Asman. Lars Ebert was born in Heidelberg, 1976, and is the co-director of the Cultural Center Age 401 in Amsterdam where he develops and implements European collaboration projects. He also works in the area of higher education and the arts as an independent advisor and frequent facilitator, moderator, and speaker during international events, like today here, international events. He is a member of the Executive Committee of Culture Action Europe, the political voice of the cultural sector in Europe, and chairs the board of EQ Arts. I don't know exactly what that is, but it's maybe not of the... He is there. He, he is a good cook. He's a really good gastgeber. I don't know the English word. Host, host yes, host. I know that from personal experience. I, and uh, I now hand over to him, and I wish you an interesting and... Uh, yeah, nachdenklich machen, then whatever that means in English. Afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Miko. The introduction of myself would not have been necessary because I'm just in the humble um, role of moderating through, through the um, afternoon and not really contributing anything content-wise, but I, uh, I want to thank you, Miko, for hosting, uh, for being gastfreundlich here uh, at the Goethe, because it's, it's a fantastic location to, to have this uh, event. And um, I'm also uh, humble and excited a little bit, um, and not only a little bit, I'm quite excited because uh, Aleda um, is uh, one of my heroes and the kind of um, intellectual powerhouse which makes me really feel very small. And um, in, in the light of everyone turning up here, um, I am more than a little bit excited, but um, okay, that aside, um, it is an evening in the, in the series Die Vieldeutigkeit der Welt, as Miko already um, explained, the um, manifold um, meaning of the world would be a literal and bad translation, the multivocality of the world is maybe a better translation, and the series was conceived in conversation between the three hosts, uh, we are hosting events in this series in turn and moderating evenings in turn. So today it's 
Goethe's turn to host and my turn to moderate. But uh, the three um, uh, the th three persons that are um, developing it, um, and I, there I want to thank my two sisters in crime, I um, dare to say, um, namely Helga Marx from the Goethe Institute and Dorothee von Fleming, the chair of the Genootschap Nederland Duitsland. Uh, it's really great and an honor and a privilege to work with you on this lecture series, and it's great fun. So um, I think this will continue for a long time. I think it's really crucial that institutions work together in this way. Um, the, um, the title we, we chose because we uh, determined in, in a conversation that the current zeitgeist, as Miko already said, uh, is so, um, so full of polarization in many ways. It em emanates in uh, political populism to the very right and the, to the lev very left spectrum. Uh, in the identity politics that we've all followed in the last years, an agenda of the left that strongly plays into the uh, to, to the benefit of the far right, which puzzles all of us and we don't really know how to react on it. And of course, nationalism, part of populism, uh, with a search for the one narrative that dominates all the others and defines us um, against the others but not only us internally, but also externally, and not only to those that we don't like, but also to allies. So the geopolitical landscape is shifting in a way at the moment that uh, all leaves us not only puzzled, but scared often, and not only on a geopolitical scale, but also in Europe. Um, we don't really know who our um, friends and foes are at the moment. Um, and of course, there are the emotions that are played against facts, and uh, fiction and emotions that win elections at the moment rather than facts. And um, this struggle for truth we find also in our, um, in our own environments, in cultural institutions, for instance, where the struggle for truth um, comes to, uh, to the daylight with, for instance, the debate about changing of names of institutions, something that we have experienced quite roughly last year. Um, our institution carried the name Castrum Peregrini until a year ago, and because of the very difficult and painful past that we needed to come to terms with and work through, we changed the name, which is problematic in itself again, and there we go, the polarization starts again. The discussion goes on about objects of co uh, collections, uh, who they belong to, should they be repatriated, the stories museums tell, think of the Amsterdam Museum and their decision to call the Golden Age not Golden Age anymore, which polarizes the discussion again, and the stories they tell in general, and the question who is allowed to tell stories, who has the agency to tell stories. All these are really important discussions, but discussions that uh, do not easily allow for uh, a multivocality that this series is after. And I think this struggle for the truth um, is a struggle that ve very easily links with the thinking of uh, Aleida Asman. She and her husband, Jan Asman, refer in their work and I read it for the first time in their speech um, for the Peace Prize in 2018 uh, to Karl Jaspers, who said, truth is what unites us. And uh, if you Google Aleida Asman and then click uh, on films and YouTube videos, you'll see a fantastic little video where um, Aleida doesn't remember herself, but I really liked it, where she guides the viewer through her hometown of Constance along memory points, Stolpersteine and memorials, and talks about her work in memory studies and ends uh, with a quote, um, der Kampf um das kulturelle Gedächtnis ist im Grunde immer ein Kampf um die Erweiterung von Perspektive. The struggle for cultural memory is in fact always a struggle for a broader perspective. And I read her quote in a way as a kind of key to unlock the, the quote of uh, Karl Jaspers, uh, who said, uh, truth is what unites us. Uh, because it requires that broad perspective, I believe, and the dialogue rather than a monologue, and the recognition of the many layers and complex contexts of historic facts and ideas to determine what the truth is. And if you get to that point, you may also realize that a truth is ambiguous, and the question is then, 
how do we stand that ambiguity? How do we deal with this? And I think this question, how to stand ambiguity, is at the heart of why we, GND, um, Goethe Institute, and HAF 401, organized this series, because we want to contribute a little bit to the awareness about this polarity and maybe get to a point that we can deal with it a little bit easier. The first speaker in the series was Wolfgang Schmidbauer, just at the end of last year. He contributed a psychoanalytic perspective, and today with Aleida we'll have a cultural critical perspective. And I would hope, um, in the light of the series, that it is not only another lecture that talks the talk, but helps us a little bit also in our daily lives to walk the walk. And there I'm really uh, grateful, and I'm uh, well, grateful. I'm, um, really positive about Aleida because her whole work um, is for a big part building bridges between the academic discussion and the discussion in, in civil society and in politics. And um, this is um, why um, it's so important, I think, um, to finally have you here. A few words about her pers person and work. Um, I meditated whether we need to introduce her at all, because Aleida is, in my opinion, a sort of a rock star in the memory studies. And um, I'm, I'm sure you are all here because uh, you know who she is. So uh, I'm, uh, it's a bit uh, obsolete. But still, um, uh, the, the rock star metaphor came up when in an email exchange about this evening, more than half a year ago, uh, Aleida apologized, saying, well, sorry for not getting back to you earlier, but I just come back from a tournée. I thought, wow, a tournée, you know, it's uh, rock stars do tournées. And then I realized, well, she is that. And not only in the, memory, in the land of memory studies, but far beyond because her contributions to the public debate are present in the media, in the press, and she engages uh, broadly in discussions that are concerned with our societies today. Um, her academic career started with um, her studies of uh, English literature and Egyptology in Heidelberg in Tübingen, where she wrote a dissertation in 1977 on the legitimacy of fiction. In 1991, she uh, submitted her habilitation and became professor in Constance in 1993, where she's still a uh, professor, meanwhile emeritus, Emerita, I don't know what the, how to call that correctly. Um, and underway, she had a countless, um, countless engagements as visiting professors overseas. And here, um, the list of publications uh, is endless, would be endless. Uh, you will all know the Erinnerungsräume, maybe uh, Die Zeit ist aus den Fugen, or her very recent book about Europe. Uh, she told me on the way from the bus to the hotel that she really needs to finish a book now, uh, but because she's uh, on, on a tournée constantly, um, it does requires a special discipline. Um, almost as long, no, not as long, but quite impressively long is the list of prizes that she won. I'm not going to mention them all. It starts with the honorary doctorate of the University of Oslo in 2008 and ends, or maybe there's, it doesn't end, maybe there was another one, but uh, with a kind of peak in the Peace Prize of the German book traders, 2018. And somewhere in between, there was the Dr. Aha Heineken Prize, 2014, in Amsterdam, uh, where she also spoke with uh, the Genootschap Nederland Duitsland and back then still Castrum Peregrini about forms of forgetting. Asman is a member of countless committees also, which I'm not going to mention, just one, not because that is so important for Asman's curriculum, not at all, but for us it's important that she's part of our scientific council at age 401, and in that respect, or mainly also as a human being, the conversations with her were crucial for us uh, because she had a critical and empathetic perspective on how to deal with our difficult past, which has helped us a lot. We are talking about this lecture today for a long time already, and finally it happens. So without further ado, I would like to ask all of you to welcome Aleida with a, a warm applause uh, for her lecture. Thank you so much, um, 
Lars for this uh, introduction. I'm really quite proud um, to be invited uh, or hosted by these three institutions. Um, for me, this is an exciting event because it is a European event. I always love to cross European borders because I think being or European, uh, what it's about is to cross these borders and to talk to each other. So I'm, I'm really uh, delighted <clears throat> to be here and also to exchange with you some ideas and thoughts about a situation uh, that is, uh, Lars said it already, extremely critical and we're all concerned. So the best thing is in this moment to share these concerns and share our thoughts. <clears throat> First of all, what is the communal spirit? This is my topic. Um, and the question is, what is the communal spirit? Can you hear me, by the way? Is it, is it loud enough, clear enough? OK, fine. Um, the simplest definition was given by US presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. He said, not me, us. That is the shortest definition of communal spirit. <clears throat> But that was, in a way, and Lars already mentioned it, also the motto of our Peace Prize speech, <clears throat> um, which we found in Karl Jaspers. Truth is what connects or unites us. Selfishness and competition that make cooperation difficult and destroy the sense of commonality do not only exist on the level of individuals. There is now also the collective egotism of nations that outdo each other <clears throat> and endanger the peace of the world. In a recent interview, Salman Rushdie noted that the three countries where he has lived and still lives all embody the same model. Narendra Modi with India first, Boris Johnson with Britain first, and Donald Trump with America first. Today we are dealing with a new nationalism that is growing more and more violent and is dividing the society with nationalist rhetoric and hatred. But it is not enough to talk only about division and hatred. We must also think about how to restore the communal spirit. In German, I call it Gemeinsinn <clears throat> at all levels, globally in the EU at the level of the nation in the cities and in the schools. In my presentation, I will focus, therefore, on the level also of cities and schools, but I will start with an autobiographical perspective on Europe. One gets older and older, and before you know it, you turn into a witness of history. I myself have lived <clears throat> in three Europe's that differ greatly from each other, and many of you may have similar Europe's to talk about and remember. The first Europe that I grew up in <clears throat> was, like myself, created after the Second World War. It lasted <clears throat> from 1945 to 1989. In this Europe, there was much talk about the Christian Occident, the um, <clears throat> Christliche Abendland. Much later, it became clear to me that in Germany, this formula had the task, above all, to cover up the Nazi past and to conjure up a grand historical continuity across the abyss of war, the <clears throat> end of the war and the hour zero. Nor did I know then anything about the architects of this Europe, whom we recognize and rightly so today, as heroes. I thought Robert Schumann was a composer, and I had never heard the name René Cassin, who prepared the Declaration of Human Rights in 48 and was awarded the Nobel, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize in 1968. The music played for me elsewhere. Everything important happened in the USA or in England. The civil rights and youth protest movements, films, pop music, and not to forget the Beatles. Europe was part of the West, and I owe my intellectual and cultural initiation to America. The East, on the other hand, was locked up in the Cold War. The first Europe of polarization was stabilized by the opposing ideologies of capitalism and communism. 
But there were also parallels across the two camps. Both sides expected everything from the future and were optimistic about rapid technological progress, which was based on, for instance, space travel and led to the moon landing <coughs> in 69. The past, however, was totally forgotten on both sides. It was, as, as it were, on the other side of the moon. The second phase followed from 1989 to 2015. I call it the Europe of pluralization. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the erosion of state socialism, the integrating power of polarization was exhausted. The EU became more interesting for me as the east of Europe moved closer. Today, in the West, people talk guiltily <coughs> or shamedly, shamedly about the enlargement uh, towards the East. For me, <coughs> the end of the Cold War and what followed was an unprecedented widening of horizons. A new space opened up between the poles. I was suddenly able to cross feared borders to meet people and to learn so much more. After four decades of forgetting the past, the history of the first half of the 20th century also returned to Europe because the horizon broadened not only in space but also in time. Eastern European arch archives were suddenly accessible and a new historical research started. The, the survivors of the Holocaust finally found a hearing. In January 2000, a new transnational politics of history emerged, starting in Sweden and supported by the USA and Israel, in which the United Germany played a special role, now called the IRA, the International <coughs> um, Remembrance Alliance of the Holocaust. This was followed by many <coughs> new monuments, by museums, and the reconstructions of memorial sites. Between the West and the East, Europe emerged anew in 1989 as a plural entity with different political perspectives, historical experiences, and traumas. It became polyphonic to the extent that it freed itself from the grip of the West and the East. Thus, a Europe emerged that asserted itself between the world powers and set new accents. It continued its Western cause of peacekeeping, democratization, and economic prosperity, but supplemented it with references to forgotten and suppressed history, as well as growing awareness as to endangered environment. The third Europe began in 2015 and continues. It was triggered by the global migration crisis, which has <clears throat> Um, much deeper and um, longer causes, um, but only with the influx or the appearance of refugees did it abruptly become manifest and enter the general consciousness and create a deep caesura. In this phase of division, the binding and integrating power of the EU is now rapidly waning. The plural Europe is put to the test everywhere by nationalistic headwinds and aggressive xenophobic tones. Ideological rifts are opening up and divisions are becoming manifest, <clears throat> no longer built between, as before, political systems, that's what we had all along, but now within societies and nations. The enemy stereotype of the first polar Europe were the East, respectively, and the West, the enemy image of the second plural Europe were Hitler and Stalin, and the new enemy <clears throat> stereotype of the third antagonistically divided Europe is the migrant and stranger who disturbs the homogeneity of society, <clears throat> ethnic societies, and threatens the unity of nations. So what holds the stars of Europe still together? For a long time, the EU seemed to be as stable and lasting as the symbol of the circle of the stars on the blue flag. That is long past. The British star has disappeared and other stars have started to skid. 
The symbol has no binding force of its own, which makes the question all the more urgent as to what actually holds these stars of Europe still together. And here you have a hoodie, which <coughs> uh, is already uh, upgraded or updated with a, a, a 28th star on the back of the shirt. So <coughs> Europe obviously is a boundless, um, vast topic. But in the flash of the actual danger, my vision of a project of Europe became ever clearer to me. I have called it the European dream, but it is really very tangible and clear. It consists of only four lessons that the member states have learned together from their history and which they now <coughs> urgently need in the current crisis. So it's not about the past, it's about the future of Europe when we think about lessons from history. After 1945, the first and most important lesson in history <coughs> was to really bring the war to an end. After the First World War, that had not been achieved. The war had ended on the battlefield, but not in the minds and hearts of the people. After the First World War, a myth of the war experience, as George Mosse called it, was constructed in Germany that later became the main pillar of the Nazi state. No wonder then that the Second World War started on German soil, German ground. The peace project of the Western European states devised after 45 was therefore utopian in the strict sense of the word. These architects transformed swords, namely coal and steel, as the most important raw materials of the war industry, into plowshares by making them the basis of a transnational economic community. In this way, mortal enemies became permanently peaceful and col uh, collaborating neighbors. The second lesson, the Freedom Project, <clears throat> was no less important. Former dictatorships, first and foremost Germany, were transformed into democracies with a strong support and economic support, think of the Marshall Plan, of the Allies. The two doctrines of peacekeeping and democratization came to, into effect once again on a large scale in 1989, after the fall of the wall and the opening of the Iron Curtain. With the end of the Cold War, further dictatorships were transformed into democracies and became members of the EU. But two lessons were added. A new, I call them a new self-critical culture of remembrance and the updating or reclaiming rather of human rights. Since these lessons are less obvious, <clears throat> but in the <clears throat> focus of our actual con controversies, they are very important. I will discuss them here in a bit more detail. So since the 19th century, nations created for themselves symbols and narratives in order to strengthen their collective self-image and to support their identity. Such a collective memory radically simplifies the historical complexity and sees everything from a single emotionally charged perspective. History has therefore always been confined in national memory to a glorious, honorable, or at least acceptable script. In the face of a guilty or traumatic past, there were usually only three sanctioned roles that national memory could accept. That of the victor who had overcome evil, that of the resistance fighter or the martyr who fought against evil, and that of the victim who passively suffered evil. What lay beyond these positions and their perspectives could not become the subject of an accepted narrative and was therefore glossed over and forgotten at the official level. And here I give you an example of how this frame of remembering and forgetting works. For instance, here in terms of victories and <coughs> defeats. So you all know when you go to Paris that there are metro stations that um, <clears throat> uh, memorialize the 
the, vic the victories of Napoleon. Uh, this is, for instance, Daus Austerlitz, and I just uh, stopped uh, at Jena, which is another uh, of these victory stations. But what you would hardly find in, in the Paris, uh, Paris metro system is a, a station uh, with the name of Waterloo, which, however, you can enter when you go to London. This is the logic of uh, framing and inclusion and inclusion in terms of national memory. But this, uh, and this is my point here, all of this, this grammar of national memory changed after the fall of the Iron Curtain, when namely the East Eastern European archives for the first time became accessible. On the basis of these sources, a new historiography emerged that expanded many national narratives and produced what I call a dialogical culture of memory. This was an absolute historical novelty. And here are a few examples. Due to new documents about the Vichy government, France was suddenly no longer ex exclusively a resistance or resistor nations, nation. France does not need truth. France needs hope. Uh, de Gaulle had affirmed, while President uh, Mitterrand, a couple of years later, proclaimed in the 1990s, Vichy, ce n'est pas la France. After the affair about the Nazi past of President Kurt Waldheim in Austria, for instance, too, <clears throat> Austria could no longer assert itself as the first innocent victim of Hitler. And that was what was actually written in the Staatsvertrag, the Constitution of Austria in um, 1955, as a neutral station, the first victim of Hitler's. And the discussion about discussions about Jedwabne and Kielce, for instance, meant <clears throat> for the Poles too that they had to deal with accusations of anti-Semitism. So they could no longer also claim that they were exclusively a victim nation, even though, of course, the difference between, <clears throat> yeah, the if, uh, difference between Austria and Poland is vast, but in the terms of the grammar of national memory, this uh, is something that um, makes them comparable. And <clears throat> even here, I would like to uh, add the neutral Switzerland set up a commission of historians to point to its banks and borders as sites of collaboration. So with the return of personal memories and the rise of scientific research, the purity and exclusivity of the ruling national narratives were called into questions and corrected in memorials, museums, textbooks, and exhibitions. And I think this process is still going on to some extent, uh, but also being rolling back uh, at the same time. I will come back to this. The fourth, <clears throat> to move on to the fourth lesson of history, human rights. This <clears throat> human rights, of course, have a long pedigree that goes back to the Enlightenment. In 2011, and you may recall this, 93-year-old um, Stefan Essel addressed the youth of Europe. He had worked on the Declaration of Human Rights in Paris um, together with René Cassin in 1948. His manifesto, Time for Outrage, and Dignez vous sold 4.5 million copies worldwide. Look around, he wrote. You'll find enough topics to be outraged. <clears throat> How to deal with immigrants, the people without legal legitimacy, with the Sinti and Roma. You will find concrete situations that will lead you to act powerfully as citizens. Seek and you will find. We didn't have to look for long. The concrete situations came up very soon. <clears throat> but with that, also the indignation changed sides and now turns against migrants and human rights. <clears throat> Today, we are at the end of this development of the EU's peaceful success story. I have so far spoken in the mode of we. The point is, however, that this we no longer exists. What in, what in Stefan Essel's time could still be regarded as a consensus has now come up against clear limits of approval. The model of civil society is being called into question by the counter model of an uncivil 
society. This is due <clears throat> not least to the internet, in which freedom of expression has degenerated into hate speech and contributes strongly to the unleashing of contempt and violence. Demagogues are in full swing, hate rhetoric with shitstorms and death, death threats is spreading and in a state of shock, we now see how violence is spreading in racist and anti-Semitic attacks. The traditional understanding of a pluralist democracy in which a critical civil society plays an important role as the pillar and motor of democracy is now confronted with a compact and ethnically homogeneous concept of people who exclude those whom they call strangers and see themselves as the true and legitimate representatives of that society. I quote Steinmeier, our president, he said, we should sharpen the concept of democracy again and not leave it to those who pursue illiberate authoritarian goals to manipulate the society. He demanded in a speech in 2018. And he added, democracy is either liberal or it does not exist. My response to this development was a book on human rights and human duties. In place of a plea for a German light culture, a normative set of rules and qualities that some, namely the Germans, always already possess and the others, the migrants, must now quickly learn. So in lieu of this, I looked for something <clears throat> like a new social contract containing rules of peaceful coexistence and respect for others. That is, forms of manners and, um, and mutual decency that apply to anyone, everyone. I did not want to start from what divides us and creates difference, but from what, uh, from what we already share and have in common, um, namely what everyone needs, or in the sense of Jaspers, um, the truth is what connects us. I was interested <clears throat> in living democracy in everyday life and rules of conduct in marriage and family, but also on the doorstep, on the street, in the neighbor, neighborhood, in the towns, communities, and of course, in schools. While there are entire libraries today dedicated <clears throat> to the history of the human rights, there is still nothing to be found on human duties. Yet they are very important <clears throat> as a complement to human rights and have become highly topical since 2015 at the peak of the migration movement uh, to Europe. What happened at the mass arrival of refugees at European borders and their arrival in the destination countries took place <clears throat> in a culture of welcome framed with an ancient catalogue of human duties. People in need were given food and drink, new clothes and a roof over their heads. These human duties are well known to us from the oldest text of mankind and reach back around 5,000 years into all cultures and religions of the world. <clears throat> a concrete example of human duties are the practical wisdoms the practical wisdom of the ancient Egyptians who made self-control and pro-social action central aspects of their public self-fashioning. In this culture, Egyptian culture, an unequal distribution of power and clear hierarchies was taken for granted, so very different from our sense of <clears throat> democracy. But those who came into positions of power had in ancient Egypt the responsibility to implement the principle of justice called ma'at in social space, which at the same time reflected the cosmic world order. <clears throat> this order is highly precarious as it is always threatened by greed and violence, arrogance and personal corruption. Inequality therefore had to be compensated for by good deeds, which opened up considerable scope for benevolent action. The following example is taken from a civil state servant's grave tomb of the 5th dynasty from um, about the 25th century BC. And here I quote from the tomb. <clears throat> I moderated uh, between two, okay, what, what is, 
happening here? Okay, this is the text. I moderated between two angry people so that they left each other satisfied. I saved the wretch from him who was more powerful. I gave bread to the hungry and clothes to the naked man, a passage to a castaway, a coffin to him who had no son, and a ship to the shipless. I honored my father, I was loved by my mother, I raised her children. So speaks he whose beautiful name is Sheshi. Christianity took over the rules of charity from the Jewish tradition and laid them down in a catalog of virtues. In the Gospel of Matthew, these virtues are repeated <coughs> various times, <coughs> and here I recall them to you. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you gave me shelter. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. And the chorus reads every time, whatever you did um, <clears throat> to the least of these brothers of mine, you did to me. In medieval times, these deeds were summed up as the seven works of Christian mercy and were often illustrated in pictures. <clears throat> they make up an amazing parallel to the ancient Egyptian rules of life. They start with the rule number one, to exhort the foolish, to admonish him, to give him advice. Uh, the second one is to give food and drink to the poor. Next one, close <clears throat> to the naked. Shelter for the homeless, visiting the sick, visiting the prisoner, and lastly, burying the dead. And the last <clears throat> image in the series, the, the eighth, um, eight, um, picture shows the recompense for award for a pious life, and this is that the angels carry the soul of the deceased <coughs> to heaven. Human rights <coughs> and human duties are complementary. Human rights are political and connect the individual with the political authority in a vertical relationship. <coughs> they protect the individual by explicitly guaranteeing him or her respect for the life and dignity of every human being, a claim that applies to all people regardless of age, sex, nationality, or race. The right to life, liberty, and security, the prohibition of slavery and torture, <clears throat> freedom of thought and belief, the right to freedom of expression, education, work, health, and well-being. <clears throat> human duties, on the other hand, <clears throat> human duties, on the other hand, are social norms that connect and apply horizontally and mutually between human beings. They include what Thomas Mann once called the ABC of human decency. These human duties <clears throat> have also been formulated and declared. This declaration was drafted in 1997 by the so-called Interaction Council, and it was submitted to the United Nations and the world for public discussion. This never happened until today. The declaration, <clears throat> as I found out, <clears throat> disappeared in a drawer, and until now the discussion has not yet taken place. I think, however, it is high time, high time to take note of it. Look at these books. The one of them um, has um, is uh, presents uh, the. Um, translation of it, of the 30 articles uh, into 40 languages. So it's high time to reintroduce these, uh, these principles uh, of human duties back into the society and to finally recognize them. And this is what I would like to add and emphasize, to recognize the article for what they are, namely a cultural monument of world heritage and really global world heritage, become, because they also come from all <coughs> different um, cultures and religions. Last, uh, next, next pa uh, 
topic is I want to show you that these, uh, this topic about human duties is not far-fetched fetched at all, <clears throat> but instead that there are very clear links between the tradition that I have just um, reconstructed for you and uh, sketched here on the one hand and the political issues which we are facing today. In order to show this, let me introduce to you the history of the first German flight and migration monument. <laughs> Initially, it was part of the 2017 documenta that took place in the city of Kassel. One of the participants was the Nigerian-American artist Olu Ogibe, who erected a 16-meter obelisk of granite slabs on the lively Königsplatz in the center of the city. In the lower part, he engraved an inscription in gold capital letters. The text, however, could be read on four sides in four languages, in German, English, Turkish, and Arabic. I was a stranger and you have given me shelter. At the end of the documenta, citizens of Kassel decided that the obelisk should remain at its location and donations were collected to buy the artwork. Thus, the obelisk remained in the city and became the first flight and migration monument in Germany. Due to its outstanding visibility, it made headlines and became the impetus for a heated debate. The work of art is remarkable in many respects. Firstly, it is astonishing that in a secular society, an artist today places a quotation from the Bible in the, pub, in, in the public uh, space that is dominated otherwise by symbols such as messages of advertising or the logo, logos of consumer culture. Secondly, and perhaps even more astonishingly, this verse from the Bible, <clears throat> which is after all part of Christian and Western cultural memory, is perceived by part of the local population as an intolerable provocation. In fact, the representatives of the AFD reacted with hostility to the obelisk. Mr. Ogibi should wrap up his work of art instead of bothering our beautiful city with this unspeakable topic. They referred to this art as deformation and denounced the obelisk as a symbol of power. In the course of the debate, the obelisk was transformed into a clinical thermometer on which the degree of the heated positions of the controversy could be read. The SPD mayor finally gave in to the pressure and had the objectionable monument removed. This happened of all days on October 3rd, 2018. He chose the symbolic date of reunification of Germany to show so our public uh, <clears throat> holiday of the national holiday, that such a monument does not fit into the center of a German city. After that, the obelisk <clears throat> lay dismantled. After that, the obelisk lay dismantled in a safe place and patiently awaited its further fate. Several cities abroad expressed their interest in the work of art. But even in Kassel, the drama was not yet over. A new location for the obelisk was found on the so-called Treppenstraße. This is Germany's <coughs> first pedestrian zone, which has a close connection to the history of art and the documenta. The obelisk was indeed re-erected at the new location, <coughs> but now in this place its meaning also is slightly al altered. What had been a public monument in the Königs, on the Königsplatz is now more of an art event on the Treppenstraße. This monument was created by an artist with a history of migration. The science from the Gospel of Matthew, I was a stranger and you sheltered me, is spoken from the perspective of a migrant. Ugibe has summarized his thoughts on his work as, following, as follows. The obelisk, he said, is a timeless form, a form that dates back to antiquity. Originally, it comes from Africa. It traveled around the world. We use it in this context to project a universal, timeless principle into the future, the idea of mercy and hospitality towards strangers. 
In fact, what is special about this monument is that it radically rededicates a symbol of the victors, of power and imperial rule, and makes it the bearer of a completely different message. It used to be the symbol of power of pharaohs, of course, Egyptian pharaohs, but it is now made <clears throat> into a bearer of a message um, that <clears throat> uh, lasts over time, namely human rights and human duties. From the artist's point of view, the castle obelisk conveys yet another message, and that is gratitude to the hosts. I quote here a larger re reflection <clears throat> of the artist. For I believe that mercy and hospitality ultimately require uh, reciprocity. I think it is important to note that hosts have costs. Kindness is not for free. I'm more interested in the positive history of the city, a city where strangers, visitors, people from different parts of the world found a home. What we want to acknowledge, we want to acknowledge that. To open your door to a stranger is an act of trust. All this is interwoven in the text chosen for the inscription. It affirms the need for hospitality. It, it affirms the need for re reciprocity, the recognition that charity is an act of trust. When such strangers come into a community, they also bring something with them. They bring skills, they bring diversity, culture, they bring cuisine. In this way, they enlarge the community, they enrich the community, they enrich the human experience. For me, the goal is to leave a space for reflection, for contemplation, perhaps even <coughs> for, um, perhaps even a, a debate on the question of hospitality and gratitude. So we are not only de dealing here with a Denkmal, which is the word for monument in German, but also with a Dankmal, you know, it's because it has to do with thanking. At the same time, the obelisk is also a symbol for the stranger himself. It is itself a foreign body that stirs up emotions, provokes heated debates, and has to be removed from public space. Works of art are symbolic objects and substitutes. They have the power to make sensually visible what is invisible in the society. Ogibe's obelisks, obelisk symbolically expressed and publicly reenacted what the debate is all about. Integration or exclusion, diversity and participation or isolation in a um, <clears throat> homogeneous community. Everything related to the obelisk was symbolic, including its removal. The hole left in the ground was immediately perceived as a wound. Flowers were placed there as a sign of sadness and empathy. But this is exactly what works of art can do. They can bring expressed and unexpressed feelings in a society to the surface by giving them a concrete form and thus making them visible, tangible, audible. They also help to create a story that shapes the conflict by provoking words, feelings, statements, and actions. In Kassel, some believe that the controversial flight and migration memorial has triggered the most interesting and lively debate since the actions of Josef Beuys. Now is growing together what belongs together. <clears throat> These were the familiar words that Willy Brandt uttered when commenting on the fall of the wall. After the peak of the migration moment, the, uh, movement, the sentence could be, now is growing together what does not belong together. This phrase was written and comes from the sociologist Ulrich Beck and can be found in his book about the multicultural change in the society of the 1980, 1990s. A development that continues and is nowhere more visible and tangible now than in the cities. That is why it is important to keep an eye on cities and communities because this is where the complex problems of immigration and integration become concrete. Where we see active commitment on the one hand and acts of blockage on the other, where we witness both integration and provocation. Unlike in other countries, in federalist Germany, the cities act to a much greater extent, 
maybe it's the same here in the Netherlands, I don't know, but in Germany this is certainly the case. I come to believe after a long, long thinking and experience. Um, so the cities in Germany act to a much greater extent as collective actors and develop a specific profile. In the cities, groups and initiatives were formed on the spot looking for traces and reclaiming history. This was the case in the process of coming to, coming to terms in Germany with the Nazi past, and it is again the case <coughs> when dealing with the problems of migration and the challenges of democracy. This dimension of a locally anchored history from below seems to be a German pe particularity. Pe peculiarity. In centralist countries such as England or France, I know of no parallel. In Germany, the cities are the framework and location for different orientations and projects. Since there is no translocal media coverage, one city knows little or nothing about what is happening in another city, until the latter, like the cities of Zwickau or Hanau or Halle, um, come into the headlines. The stumbling blocks, for instance, Gunter Demnek is going to come to Amsterdam too, now lie almost everywhere and have become a common feature. But the ne necessary research into the individual histories of deported Jewish citizens is always locally anchored and part of the existing or non-existing historical consciousness, profile and self-image of the city. One example here is uh, the city of Regensburg, formerly a free imperial city, which has uh, Reichstadt, yeah, uh, which has retained much of its autonomous self-confidence. A mosque was built here, and this uh, last year, <clears throat> a new synagogue was ceremonially opened by the whole city. The city also participated in the rescue operation of German cities to take in refugees rescued on the Mediterranean. The mayor who receive hate, receives hate mails and threatening letters is not discouraged. discouraged. She has just awarded the city's <coughs> prestigious bridge prize to the philosopher and civil rights activist Caroline Emke in a public ceremony. The city of Nuremberg is another example of a city that, very much unlike Munich, is working through and exhibiting its Nazi history. It also belongs to the group of European human rights cities, which are symbolically marked um, in Nuremberg in, a, as in an installation of a human rights road along columns on which excerpts from the 30 articles of the German constitutions are engraved. The more we restrict the space we talk about, the more openly the problems we are dealing with become apparent. Kindergartens and schools today are the place where different cultural identities, origins and biographies meet. These contrasts become more and more intense with the increase in the number of new Germans. The global and the local meet in the classroom supported by the parallel world of the internet which not only overcomes geographical barriers, but also contributes to the brutalization of communication and copying of patterns of violence. Just think of the new axis, global axis of right-wing terror, recently established between, <clears throat> we should add the city of Vienna, Christchurch, New Zealand, Halle and Hanau. The problem of moderating culture and communication has become more and more difficult. After selfish impulses that have always existed, antisocial and aggressive styles of behavior are becoming increasingly apparent and are now tolerated by a growing part of the population. This makes the search for, an, for the question of an ABC of human decency all the more urgent. Are there ways to contain hatred and content, contempt and to reduce the current division in, a, in the society? In her book Against Hate, Caroline Emke writes, it often only requires a gesture, an objection or encouragement in order to consolidate the ground on which we all stand. 
this is these are acts of civil courage, and she says some, sometimes it, it's, it can be a very small sign that consolidates the ground on which we all stand. But the question is, can one learn to abstain from hatred and to overcome it? Emke describes the process away <clears throat> from fellow humanity, fellow feeling, to hatred <clears throat> as a path that is also possible to retrace in the opposite direction. The recipe is actually quite simple. If hatred is created by unquestioning certainty, one is cocksure about something, drastic narrowing of perception, lack of concreteness, and the transformation of people into stereotypes, then it disappears or wanes through doubt. Doubt is, Zweifel is very important, is the counter to this um, self-affirmed um, um, clear uh, position of unquestioned certainty. <clears throat> Doubt, closer uh, inspection, differentiation, and the view of people as concrete individuals. Empathy and the ability to shift the perspective and to probe the position of the other are powerful tools against the force of hatred. But we must not underestimate cultural frames and the long-term forms <clears throat> of planting hatred into human minds and hearts. To remove this deeply ingrained structure of hatred, it is nece necessary, according to Caroline Emke, to break all the links, the conceptual and pictorial distortions and stigmatizations that have, practiced, have been practiced over years and decades, to subvert all the patterns of perception, the grids by which individuals become collectives and the collectives are fused with stereotypes and negative attributions. This task should begin with children because learning is the key word here too, just as hatred, which does not simply arise but is learned, supported and reproduced within racist social and cultural frameworks, so too must decency be learned, built up and anchored in the minds and hearts of people in a step-by-step -step long term process. Teachers have long since devoted themselves to this task and have accumulated important insights and experiences. Their ex expertise is now in great demand. Unfortunately, however, these insights are still hardly implemented. In schools, for instance, all learning support activities that already existed, such as language teaching, attention training or social learning, have been cut in recent years. This, however, there is, however, a wealth of experience, expertise, and concrete offers for social learning, which only needs to be put back into practice. One example is the project Learning to Live Together by Günther Hennig. In his Institute for Applied Social Science Research, he has developed a pedagogical diagnosis which makes it possible to rate the pedagogical basic care provided in a school class, which is the prerequisite for any specialized instruction. He has developed concrete teaching units for two subject areas. One concerns the development of compassion. Empathy is part of every <clears throat> basic human endowment, as neuroscientists have confirmed since the millennium, beginning of the millennium, but it must be initiated or cultivated so that it is, can also consolidate into an attitude and become part of the de uh, development of a personality. Another learning unit concerns the ability to change perspectives. This is also a basic cognitive ability that can be developed and increased through systematic training. Empathy and the ability to change perspectives are seminal prerequisites for the communal spirit. They prevent us from making our own point of view <clears throat> absolute and help us to empathize with others, to understand and communicate with them and to enter with them into cooperative and creative relationships. I come to my conclusion. Society today is faced with enormous tasks, including and challenges, including the problem of climate change and the preservation of natural environment, 
as well as economic inequality and media changes in our society. But without consolidating the ground on which we stand, to take up again uh, Caroline Emke's formula, in short, without peace, democracy, and solidarity, the current challenges of our society cannot be actively taken up, let alone overcome. For an open country with free people. This was written on a poster <clears throat> at a demonstration a few weeks before the wall came down 30 years ago. One of the two women who held it up had to go to prison for it. The same motto must be taken up again today. This is what a poster campaign in Germany actually is doing right now. <clears throat> and here I show you some of the ads. We live diversity on the principle of equality, <clears throat> or we are love that lasts, and a country that is able to learn. Or we believe in freedom and in the freedom of belief. Underneath each of these words, there's always the refrain, I don't know how to express it, we are a constitutional state, wir sind Rechtsstaat. Power and honor and pride are words from the vocabulary of the nationalists, which unfortunately for many people today are more understandable and audible than words like reflection, learning, responsibility, solidarity and empathy. But it is precisely these words that we must reclaim for a new self-image of a plural society and civil nation if we want to save the European dream and let it not end up in another nightmare. We are a constitutional state. Wir sind Rechtsstaat. Or more precisely, noch sind wir Rechtsstaat. We are still a constitutional state. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Aleida. It uh, was more than we had expected, I think. And um, when I said in the beginning um, that I hope, or we hope with this series, not only to uh, talk the talk, but um, learn a bit about how to walk the walk, you've given quite concrete examples uh, that could be followed up. You talked about the role of art in public space, uh, about uh, education, the human duties as opposed to human rights mm -hmm. or complementary yeah. to the human rights uh, and something like a poster campaign in the end and education. But uh, if I may say so, shootings uh, give us a certain sense of urgency and, and I made a little note when you sta said, used the word in a state of shock. Uh, in the light of an uncivil society. And it also seems, it feels a little bit helpless. And those are long-term goals, and it would be fantastic if we can reach them. But there's a sense of acting now. Um, what role is there for politics as opposed to civil okay. society? Well, uh, this is exactly what I want to <coughs> avoid. Um, because if we, in a state of, if we, if we think in a state of shock, all we can do is overreact. <laughs> or not react. Um, um, so what I want to do first is to uh, reframe the issues and the question in such a way that it becomes palpable and accessible again. You know, it cannot be um, XXL. Uh, it needs to be reduced uh, into a, a smaller scale uh, so that we can approach it and think about it. And um, of course it needs a lot, uh, it, it needs time and it, it, it needs attention. And attention is a form of time that is qualitative time. You have to dedicate yourself to something. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, you cannot just uh, produce uh, in, a, in a certain, uh, under, under pressure. But uh, actually, this is, uh, you, you spoke of me as the emerita. Uh, here, I have, to, I have to come back to this um, point in the introduction. Actually, I see it as a, as a blessing almost um, to finally have the, the chance to step out of the university and look at the world outside uh, the university and go into the cities and talk to people and also travel into uh, other countries. 
And the more I look at the university from outside, which was my habitat for two uh, decades, and of course I was, was raised in it, and I'm fully you know, uh, <clears throat> adapted to it, I can also say now that seeing the university from the outside is a, is a very important um, addition um, for my <clears throat> thinking. Um, because I see that um, many, many issues uh, that are dealt with in the university, in the discourses there, uh, are in a <clears throat> very stable uh, form of <laughs> um, mobility, namely going in a circle, you know, years after years. The same concepts are treated and retreated over and over again. The same questions are asked. And I'm becoming so much aware of the fact that um, the, the norms are so strict within which circles and authorities you have to move. So it's, it's very difficult to take up issues and to, um, to connect with uh, things that happen, happen outside. So that is um, one of the benefits of um, being sort of free to, to leave the university and, and to look at these issues from the outside, which means, um, and this is um, the point really, we, have, we are always in the university moving in fields that are very, very, very um, narrow. And then if we work together with colleagues, we call it interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinary, we are very proud and so on. But still, we are very much um, confined to our uh, concepts. And um, what, what very seldom happens is the interaction between uh, the level of um, actual uh, quotidian life and, and um, praxis uh, and uh, the level of um, creating theories. And this is exactly what I'm after. I would like to uh, uh, create bridges. I think you said it already mm -hmm. in the introduction. Thank you. You got the point. And um, uh, this is this is what I want to do further. And right right now, I'm um, have actually wrote up more or less what I told you today in a kind of application for a, for um, a, a price at the consensus. There is an industrial. Um, a person who dedicates some of his money uh, for scientific research, and uh, we were just told that we get a little bit of money <laughs> to also do something uh, with this project. Actually, we were uh, chosen. And this is um, the possibility, really, to put into action a few ideas. I mean, this is not grand mm -hmm. scale, and uh, but it is on a small scale something that I have always hoped uh, I would be able to do, to interact um, with people on these different levels. Actually, my intellectual uh, um, projects uh, are not um, um, left behind. I'm, I'm, I'm working on, uh, I'm, because I'm very interested in the relationship um, between the EU and the concept of the nation. That's the concept, uh, the next book that I'm uh, working on. So I'm, I'm going ahead with this topic. But at the same time, I want to see other levels that are more concrete and more definite and more clearly framed. And this is, uh, would be the level of the city. And the city is so important for me because I see these different cities as I travel and as I talk to people. And it's amazing. Every city has its own history, its own physiognomy, its own profile, and uh, its own, of course, it's always the groups who are active in these cities. And there are cities in, in which no groups may be active, of course, but those in which there is a very strong communal uh, life, um, uh, there are enormous potentials there, but they are not really addressed and not really acknowledged. And one can perhaps learn, one city can learn from another and so forth. So I see possibilities to uh, encourage these developments that are all very obvious there. And what I really refrain from doing is to uh, stare in a hypnotized way on, on all the evil that we, uh, is around us. And I try to focus on um, exactly the opposite, namely all the um, potential that is also there, because we should not be blinded um, even in this sh uh, state of shock, and that's not a good state to think in. We should not be blinded by it, because there's always the other half who is doing the opposite, but they don't get media coverage. So we always have a very... Um, <clears throat> Uh, unbalanced mm -hmm. Thank picture. You. Yeah.
Um, I, will, I will skip all the other questions that I got on my paper because uh, cautious of the time that is running out, I would like to open uh, the, the conversation to the audience immediately as I am sure there are, must be questions to Aleida or contributions to the conversation. And there's immediately one in the back, Merapi, I see. Yes, I have uh, lots of questions, but I only will have asked one question. My name is Merapi Obermeyer, and at the moment we are in a situation that about, you know, the word political correctness. And I have the feeling that political correctness is standing in the way from reclaiming history, because we, we cannot tell the truth anymore, because you have to skip a lot of parts from history. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, people use political correctness for the emancipation from the minority groups. So, mm -hmm. so the question is maybe how to deal mm -hmm. with political correctness. Yeah. We take maybe a, two or three questions how at a time. How, how it is in, uh, it's, it's standing in the way for people that need to Okay. So it's more a comment to reflect upon? This is it for the moment? Okay, then we don't need to collect. Okay. Um, thank you. We cannot talk on this general level here. We always have to be much more concrete so we each other know what we talk about. Um, political correctness in terms of history. This is a um, topic that I just touched upon in my lecture when I spoke about, uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> the metro stations in Paris. And um, in what I could have done uh, in, had I had more time, uh, I would have offered you an intellectual concept that I find extremely useful, and that is the concept of Maurice Halbwachs. Maurice Halbwachs is a memory <clears throat> scholar who is uh, very unusual in, from, in that he comes from sociology and not from history or psychology, psychology which used to be the field where memory was being dealt with. So he comes from sociology and he had this idea that we never remember just for ourselves and by ourselves we're already tuned to or turning to somebody and we are actually very social beings who interact and uh, we remember too. Actually, these are the words from uh, Susan uh, Sontag, which she, which she once used. We always remember too, to somebody. It's a very... <coughs> communicative and social action to remember. And uh, therefore, it, it creates bonds and, and also bounds and, and frames. And this is the term that he comes up with, the frame. And the frame is the kind of, <clears throat> um, yeah, the bond that c keeps these people together and uh, who share memories. Uh, they don't all have the same memories. They <clears throat> contribute their memories, but it's all uh, shared within a certain frame. And this is um, a very useful term, not only for the social quality of memories, but also on another level for the political memory, uh, form uh, of memory, especially national memory. And in this case, um, I use the term phrase to uh, reconstruct the frames within national memory, for instance, is constructed. And there we have um, political decisions made, what is to go into this frame and what is to stay out of it. And so in a way, the frame is always what uh, uh, controls the mechanism of remembering and forgetting. This is what the frame does. And if you now um, ask uh, that political correctness, that would be another term for what I call frame now, um, we always have these frames, and uh, you already said it's a po um, important that we uh, use the frame not as something to exchange one picture for another, like a picture frame, but to extend the frame to make the picture more varied, more complex, and more able to deal with, and also inclusive for the others who are excluded. When we agree upon that, then we should uh, now uh, talk about exactly which stories um, and experiences are excluded and in which way this frame can be transformed. Because the, the point about this, the, the language uh, for, uh, for all of these mechanisms that uh, elude us because we are driven by them and we have very little power over them as long as we, we are just um, <clears throat> uh, controlled by them rather than take control over them ourselves. We need the, the language, the concepts. 
uh, it helps us actually to think about uh, changing frames and reconstructing them and discussing uh, communally within a society what should be in it and uh, what uh, should not be in it. And from that point of view, I think it would be uh, make much more sense, first of all, to have a conceptual um, language, vocabulary to deal with, uh, to, to help to um, discuss this, these topics and then also know exactly which issues are involved. On this very abstract and uh, general level, uh, it's very difficult to get ahead. Um, and, but it, I think one could sit together and uh, raise um, um, uh, yeah, topic and uh, discuss it um, in a productive way. So you certainly hit an important point, but I cannot develop it further now without further uh, details. Thank you, Aleda. Um, all the way in the back, um, there's a question, if we get a microphone there. Thank ah, you. Mulsari. Hi, my name is Mulsari, and as an artist, I love what you said about moving from theory to practice. So I'm going to ask you kind of a large creative question. What could you imagine is necessary or what needs to happen in order to move from this divided Europe or world where everyone wants to be first to a world where borders become not just dissolved but maybe even irrelevant? What could you imagine needs to happen? Okay, um, now you ask me to move from one extreme to the other. It's, it's very difficult to envision such a project because um, e extremes are highly problematic. I think they are important to uh, when we think about possibilities. If we um, <clears throat> sort of uh, design the field in which we want to move and so forth, that's, that's important. But then um, when we think about a world in which we don't have any borders anymore and everything is dissolved, that uh, could... Uh, create an atmosphere in which um, many people would start to become uh, either chaotic or feel very insecure or whatever, and then they will maybe in a in a reacting uh, way uh, or, or overreacting way reconstruct very very tight borders. So we will would like to also to get out of this dynamic of uh, being you know drawn either to the to the extremes and therefore re an acting um, a game that is in the end uh, uh, problematic. Now, the role of art for me is extremely uh, impossible. F for me, the uh, art is something like a second order uh, observation of the society and it um, allows um, <clears throat> people who live together um, through the um, perspective of the artist or better, the work of art, um, a new view on what, who they are, what they do, how they live. And um, I think this is what uh, Ugibe's mm, monument has, has also beautifully demonstrated. You get a new perspective. And um, uh, reflection, uh, as Caroline Imke also uh, emphasizes, is something that is very conducive to uh, the communal spirit and to uh, a higher level of um, living together. And um, when it comes to the question of how much cohesion do we need and how little, uh, um, um, how, um, how much do we need and uh, uh, what is the minimal, you know, the minimal level of cohesion that we need in order not to, uh, not to dissolve. I think we are also right now in a situation in which we, un, uh, after the long identity uh, discourses that we had since the 1980s and 90s, um, we cannot forget this discourse altogether. Um, the world has changed, historical sensibilities have changed, our picture of man, human beings and, and life has changed. We cannot undo all of this, but we can think about <clears throat> Um, uh, definitely think about uh, ways and forms how to cohere without violence. That is the, that is the uh, point. That we want to connect and, and cohere um, is, is one thing. Um, uh, um, how we do it is the, is the other thing. And uh, to do it in a non-violent and non-exclusive and so forth. I think this is exactly the, the goal that we are 
<clears throat> um, we are having in mind if we want to uh, recover the lessons of history that I think uh, the EU has drawn from its history. And what I'm, I'm, I'm picking them up and I'm putting them back on the table. They are, they are never really actually uh, identified and uh, acclaimed and praised. And therefore, the first step is to uh, remember um, <clears throat> them and to remind us of them so that we take them more seriously for the future. And exactly if you um, heed these lessons and uh, if you abide by them, uh, then it, it will not be so difficult to develop exactly that kind of uh, form of cohesion uh, that is um, uh, that remains civil as opposed to uncivil, and that is uh, non-violent, and that is uh, and still uh, provides some communal uh, cohesion. Thank you very much. I'm getting signs that we are running out of time, um, so I would like to thank you full-heartedly for your contribution and invite all of us to stay a little bit longer. Oh, well, not I invite, the Goethe Institute invites for uh, drinks, for Borl, for an Umtrunk um, downstairs, uh, with the possibility to ask all those questions that you don't dare to ask now uh, in a more informal setting to Aleida. And I would like to thank all the hosts and everyone who's here uh, for being here and for the conversation, and especially you again. Thanks very much. Okay.